If you have been on the tank enthusiasts corners of the internet for any meaningful amount of time, you would have noticed that it is not uncommon for tank enthusiasts to make a case for the US medium tank M4 Sherman as being the best tank of the second world war. Whilst the nature of the question is faulty for many reasons and many other tank enthusiasts will more than eagerly give you a lecture about doctrinal requirements, industrial capacities, and strategic needs that would make the idea of debating over a single definitive best tank rather futile, the Sherman indeed does have qualities that would make it a very potent contender for the title if it were to be entertained. Qualities such as ergonomics, relative ease of use, and maintainability. However, there are two arguments that are often used as a primary reasoning for this claim that I believe should not be used as frequently as they are. The first being that the Sherman could be converted into specialist variants, and the second being that it saw service in every front of the war. This video mainly looks on the second claim, but the problem with using both these claims as the primary reasoning for such arguments, other than being overly simplistic, is that they are arguing on the basis of effect rather than cause. And secondly, if we are judging based on these parameters alone, the Sherman is not the only vehicle that qualifies. Specifically in the case of seeing service on almost every front across varying geographies and climates of the theaters, the two other mainline medium tanks, Panzer IV and T-34, operated in three out of the four major biomes during the war itself, with the T-34 later going on to operate in the remaining category later in its career. But even if we narrow our scope down to World War II specifically, we still have other tanks that accompany the M4 tanks like the Matilda and both the M3s. In this video I will be talking about one of those tanks, and unlike tanks such as the M3 mediums and the Matildas, this is a vehicle that saw consistent service throughout most of the war across all theaters. By consistent, I mean operation on the front lines on a reasonable scale and not relegated to auxiliary units, training purposes, or the Pacific. The Valentine tank. At first a Valentine may seem unremarkable, particularly so by mid to late war standards, but even when taking into account when it was designed and some of the tanks it was competing with, the Valentine was designed designed as a private venture by Vickers using experience accumulated from previous projects, most notably the transmission and suspension from the cruiser Mark 1 and 2. It was not given an A designation as it was a private venture not a set of requirements issued by the general staff. Unlike the T and M designations of the Soviets and Americans, the A designations of British vehicles refer more towards a set of requirements rather than a specific model. Compared to the tanks that were coming into service or were already around by the time the Valentine reached trials in 1940, it was not as heavily armored as the Matildas, it still carried a 2 pounder gun, and it did not have as high of a top speed as many of the medium tanks that were around at the time. Additionally, it was not particularly stellar in the ergonomic department. It was cramped and would begin and end its career with a two-man turret configuration. This is a stark contrast to the Krupp turrets of German medium tanks of the time, widely praised not just for their three-man configurations, but also for their general ergonomics. Despite this, the Valentine tank was the most produced British tank that saw service throughout the war across all theaters. They were used extensively in North Africa where despite being accepted as an infantry tank often they would find themselves filling the role of a cruiser tank due to shortages in dedicated cruiser tanks and thanks to the Valentine's reliability. They were particularly well liked and valued by the Red Army on the Eastern Front. It would appear strange that such an unassuming tank saw value in one of the most bloodiest and demanding theaters of human history. And this wasn't just in the early stages of the Great Patriotic War when the Red Army was desperate for anything resembling a tank to send to the front lines, but later in the war as well. In fact, the British were puzzled during the Third Protocol Lend Lease negotiations on why the Soviets were asking for continued deliveries of Valentines over newer British armor, such as the Cromwell from 1943 into 1944, with the Director of Armored Fighting Vehicles remarking that though it had done good work, the Valentine was now definitively obsolete. I don't like this thing, but I like that thing. I like that thing. What the fuck? I like that thing. You know, there are people who exist that like that thing. We will not be silenced, you chuka bleh. I like that thing. I like that thing. But I do like this thing. I don't like that thing. I don't fuck, that thing fucking sucks! I fucking hate that thing! Oh! Nevertheless, this demand was one of the key factors that led to the continuation of Valentine production beyond 1943. The Soviets would prominently use the Valentine as a light tank and would continue to see frontline service until the end of the war in Europe, as well as participating in the final major tank operations of the war as a whole in Manchuria. Plus, it is not like the British themselves didn't find a use for the Valentine later in the war as well. The chassis served as a basis for their Archer self-propelled guns, which 
which unorthodox it may seem, served well as a mobile AT gun, and the Valentine 11s and command vehicles. With this in mind, let's look at the technical characteristics once more, but taking into account the wider context, as simply comparing its qualities to its best competitors is quite misleading and does not offer a more holistic look on the situation. The two-pounder cannon at the start of the war was the same armament equipped on most British tanks, at the start of the war at least, a potent anti-tank weapon. As far as AT performance goes, it was comparable to the 37, 45, and 47 millimeter guns that served as the primary armament for most tanks, as well as the primary AT guns for the pre-war and early war period. Later, it would get upgun to the six pounder, and whilst the six pounder may seem unimpressive compared to some of what many mid-war tanks started to bear, it was still a solid AT gun throughout the war, capable of taking out most common access vehicles and even Tiger ones from the front. As for the lack of high explosive ammunition, two pounders in New Zealand service were adapted to fire Bofors high explosive ammunition. In Soviet service, the 57mm armed vehicles would eventually get HE shells, albeit having to be sourced from ammunition deliveries of the US made 57mm M1 AT guns. So the HE barrier was more of a doctrinal one that influenced supply rather than an inherent technical flaw of the gun. The 60mm of flat armor, whilst unimpressive, was actually on the higher end by pre and early war standards when most tanks barely had 30 millimeters and whilst the interior was cramped the vehicle itself had a rather small profile its maximum speed was low comparable to that of the matilda but the vehicle was more appropriately geared and had a better suspension than the matilda meaning it was able to reach its maximum speed more consistently and maintain that speed more easily than many other vehicles of its time this more consistent speed allowed it to be used as a cruiser tank and later still find a niche as a light tank its off-road performance was also respectable thanks to its better suspension that allowed it to maintain consistent speeds off-road as well. Off-road, the speed averaged around 12 to 16 kilometers per hour, which it was comparable to that of many light tanks such as the US M3 and the Soviet T-60s and 70s. When compared to these light tanks, the Valentines were more heavily armored than the former, more ergonomic than the latter, and once it was upgun to the six-pounder, more heavily armed than the aforementioned light tanks. And finally, and arguably most importantly, it was reliable. It gained a reputation for its reliability in the North African campaign, with some tanks having reached 3,000 miles by the time they reached Tunisia, and even later in the war, according to data from Soviet units, in 1944 their Valentines outlasted even late war Shermans and T-34s in terms of average engine lifespan. Being able to count on a tank being at a certain location and being in an operational condition for when it may be required is often a virtue in its own right. Its suspension and transmission were direct developments of the ones that originated on the A9 cruiser. It used components that were already being worked on and in production. They were mature designs that avoided many teething issues that many new tanks often faced, thus it was well suited to transition into mass production in Britain, particularly at a time of need, considering the massive loss of equipment following the evacuation at Dunkirk. Taking all this into account, whilst not being the best at any single particular category, the Valentine essentially ended up being the little tank that could that was there to fill a role that a military required at a period they found themselves lacking in. It was accepted into service as an infantry tank when Britain was in need of a tank that could be produced quickly and locally. It was able to serve as a cruiser tank during the North African campaign in a time when the British did not have a stable supply of dedicated cruiser tanks. And on the Eastern Front, it arrived at a time when the USSR was in a desperate situation, participating in the Battle of Moscow, and not only was it able to fulfill the role of a light tank, but but later also was a potent tank destroyer. I'm whatever Gotham needs me to be. The Valentine saw frontline service on every major front, or at least every major biome. If you don't think the archers count and you feel like the Valentine 11s were used in too fewer numbers. So that is the Valentine, a seemingly unremarkable, often overlooked little tank that nonetheless still made an important contribution to the Allied war effort. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed, please like and subscribe. It does really mean a lot to me. And if you're interested, check on the other content on my channel and also on my other social media accounts. If you're a returning subscriber, I know my uploads have been very inconsistent, but thank you for sticking through. Life has been keeping me very preoccupied. However, I do believe now I have a rough plan for doing more consistent uploads in the future, and I hope to see you again soon.